continue in Yuma, Ein He, on the base 75b. And we are still discussing the mana and the nature of it. The last thing we discussed is a dispute whether the mana is like or is the food of the angels. Rabbi Akiva's view and Rabbi Shmuel's view is that it was such that the food was entirely absorbed within the body and therefore did not produce any waste. This is what Rabbi, this was uh, Rabbi Akiva's view, based on the verse which says that we ate bread of the strong ones, abirim, lechem abirim. Whereas Rabbi Shmuel reads lechem evarim, bread of limbs, bread that's completely and fully absorbed within limbs. So we are, three lines from the bottom of the page, third to last word. The Gemara now repeats Rabbi Shmuel's view to continue analyzing it. There are actually those, because it's a repetition, there are those who actually uh, suggest that these lines shouldn't really be here. That it's a misprint that they're repeated. But nonetheless, it's in the Gemara, so they're going to repeat it. So the Gemara recaps that which Rabbi Shmuel said, which is, When Rabbi Shmuel heard the words of Rabbi Akiva, who said that the manna is the food of the angels, and Rabbi Shmuel counter-argued and said, angels don't eat. So this cannot be food of the angels. So Amr Lahem, therefore Rabbi Shmuel explained, Al Tikri Abirim, don't read the verse which states that they ate the bread of the strong ones. The word for the strong ones is Abirim. Ella rather, read the word Evarim limbs, meaning to say, Dovar, that the uh, mana was such, and Nivla bin Masayim Varboyim, Vishmon Evarim, the food was such that it was absorbed completely and fully in the 248 limbs without producing any waste. And then we discussed al I think I'm pronouncing. Then we asked, so why would they have to, why did they have to prepare shovels uh, to go relieve themselves if they produced no waste? And the Gemara answered, but uh, waste was produced by food that they acquired uh, from other nations of the world. This is what we discussed, and we discussed in more details about this yesterday. There's another opinion which says that they only started to produce waste once they complained. And we discussed yesterday what the nature of the complaint was. They complained, how is it possible for a human being to not produce waste? Right? And we suggested an explanation um, according to Hasidus, that the manna, food in general, represents Torah. The manna represents free Torah from heaven. And it's such a high level of Torah, either like an angel or at the highest level of human being in which it's completely absorbed within me and there's no sense of ego. Um, and then the Jews' complaint is, we, we can't let go of our ego like that. You chose us because we're humans, but because, we, because we're capable of failing, we can't expect that we're not going to produce any waste. That's what we suggest as an explanation. Now the Gemara offers another way of understanding, um, another element, I should say, of understanding this verse, Lecha Mabidim Ochal Ish, bread of the strong ones was eaten by man, referring to the mana, and we gave two translations to the word abirim, the strong ones, either literally the strong ones as in angels, or evarim, like a bishmol, that's the kind of food that was completely absorbed in the limbs of man without producing any waste. The word evarim meaning limbs. But the last word there is ish, lechem abirim achal ish, bread of the strong ones was eaten by man. Who is man in the singular, this ish? So says the Gemara, Top page, Ayin Vav Mud Aleph, 76a. Ze Yehoshua. This is referring to Yeshua. She Yorad Lai. They're descended for him. Man, the mana, Keneged called Yisrael, equal to all of Israel. So how many, how many people are there? Two million people, roughly. And each one's getting a, a Oimer. That was the measurement of, of mana. So Yeshua is getting equivalent to all of them. What's he doing with all his mana? Um, what's he doing with all his mana? So that should already be enough to convince you that the mana isn't just literal. It means, it also means Torah knowledge. And that would make sense. Yeshua, as Moshe Rabbeinu, his prodigal student, received Torah equivalent to all the Jews because it's the next generation who is teaching all the Jews Torah. Right? So if you're taking it literally, which is possible, the Gemara means literally too. It's, it's Likely so, meaning 
back up a little bit. When the Torah says something, biblically speaking, we know it's literal, this is what God did. When the Gemara speaks of drush, homiletics, within, like, you know, extrapolated storylines from within the text, it could be literal, but it's more primarily metaf- more metaphoric for some idea. It certainly could be literal. And therefore, in this sense right here, that Yeshua receives mana equal to all of Israel, makes much more sense within, if we're talking about Torah, even though it could also mean the literal level. Does that make sense? And if you're not convinced, here's even further. Let's look at the Rashi in the top right. The first Rashi there. Rashi, for whatever reason, decides that he has to elaborate to us and tell us when Yeshua got all this mana. When did it happen? When did he get all this mana according to, equivalent to all of Israel? Meaning without Rashi, I would have just said, I don't know, throughout his life he got mana equivalent to all of Israel. But Rashi tells us specifically when it happened. It says like this. Top of the, the right-hand column, Rashi. The first uh, line. Ze Yeshua. He first he quotes the Gemara, which says that the word Ish, the man, the one man that the Tehillim says got the bread of the strong ones, is referring to Yeshua. And the Gemara said because he got, he, got, he got mana equivalent to all the Jews. So it says Rashi. Sha'Allah in Moshe. Yeshua, which went up with Moshe, Ad Chasumayahar, to the border of the mountain. Meaning the Jews were told that they're not supposed to go up the mountain. But Yeshua went to the absolute end of where he's allowed to go legally. He went as close as he possibly could. Rashi mentions this in the Chumash as well. Closer than the others. Closer than the others. That's what he's going to say. the verse reads, Bayaka Moshe, that Moshe got up, a Yeshua Mesharsa, and Yeshua his attendant. The Yal Moshe Lahar, El Har Sinai, and Moshe went up to Mount Sinai. But Yeshua went, went with him. Right? The, verse, the beginning of the verse says that Moshe and Yeshua got up, and then it says that Moshe, only Moshe went up. That means to say that Yeshua went as far as he went, can, as far as he could, and he stayed there. Right? This is uh, the verse that describes Yeshua as La Yamush Mipia Oil, that Yeshua never left the tent of Moshe Benu, because he always stood as close as he possibly can to get and learn whatever he possibly can. And Asha continues, V'himtim lo Yeshua shang kal mem yoyim. Moshe, Yeshua waited at this point, closest to the mountain, for all the 40 days. Shenemar, how do we know that Yeshua was there and not with the people? Another verse, V'yishma Yeshua, Yeshua heard, as kala am bara. Yeshua heard the voice of the people behaving badly, referring to the uh, moment of the golden calf. Right? Which means Yeshua wasn't there. He heard it. Lamadnu. This implies He wasn't there. Visham. And there at that juncture. And this, for these 40 days, when, Moshe, when Yeshua is sitting at the foot of the mountain, as far as he possibly co- can go, okay, Hashem said, don't come up the mountain. But as far as he possibly can go, that's when he got Visham Hayayorid Loyamon Kenegid Kal Yisrael. And that's when he would get the manna equivalent to all of Israel. So this further points us in the direction that the manna is representative of getting tired of Hashem. Because not only is it Yeshua getting this inordinate amount of manna, it's also specifically, according to Rashi, specifically at the time when he's standing at the foot of the mountain when Moshe Ben is getting the Torah. Could he also be referred to as the strong one? So, the contextually, the verse doesn't, doesn't read that way, because the verse reads, bread of the strong ones was given to man. Right? So the strong ones are referring to the Jewish people and one man got equivalent to all the Jewish people? The Could be. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Why do they call it man sometimes? Man? Oh, my, uh, my, uh, like the mana? In, uh, in, like in Torah language, the, the A is dropped. The, the A is added in English. Like in just the, the text of Chumash and Talmudic, it's just Mem Nun, which is Man. The Man, actually the comets. But the Mana is just, I don't know why they translate it into English, adding an extra A at the end, I don't know. Anyway, so Yeshua is the one who gets Mana equivalent to all the Jewish people. That's the literal, literal level. And on the uh, deeper level that we're talking, Mana is representative of Torah. And that would mean that Yeshua received Torah equivalent to all the Jews, which is what happened. Moshe Rabbeinu received all of Torah, equivalent to all Jews, right? All the, all the Torah that all the Jews knew was given to Moshe, 
And Yeshua got the same thing, right? He got all the Torah that all Jews would have learned. Yeshua also received because he's part. He was one responsible for teaching Torah to the next generation. But now the Gemara quotes, cites a verse to back up the notion that Yeshua is referred to as Ish, right? Because the Tehillim says, "Lechem abidim achal Ish." Bread of the strong ones was eaten by man. Bread of the strong ones refers to the manna. However, you translate the word "strong one," either angels or completely absorbed within the body. But Ish is Yeshua, this man, the single old man, Ish. So we need to uh, prove that Yeshua is referred to as Ish, a man. So it says the Gemara, "Ksiv hacha." It says here with respect to this verse in Tehillim, "Lechem abidim achal Ish." The Ksiv and it says there elsewhere. This is a verse. Sorry? Yeah, we did have that. That's only a few to find as men. Yeshua. We had no way. It, was, it wasn't in Brachas, it was in Sanhedrin. You're right, we did have that. A list of people referred to as Ish. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The humble ones. They refer to as Ish, yeah. Hey, very good, I don't remember. Right. I have to revisit that Gemara. Yeah, you're right, thank you. To revisit that. Okay, so what's the other verse which describes Yeshua as Ish? The Abbasid says this, God tells Moshe, take Yeshua, son of Nun. This is when Hashem commands Moshe Rabbeinu to anoint Yeshua as a leader, to appoint Yeshua as the next leader. And says, Yeshua ben Nun, take Yeshua, son of Nun, Ish, the man, Asher Ruach boy, that has the spirit within him. So that's Ish, man. So here we see that Yeshua is referred to as man, and therefore when the verse states in Tilim that bread of the strong ones was eaten by man, this is a reference to Yeshua. Now the Gemara asks, Ve'ema, perhaps Moshe, maybe Moshe Rabbeinu is this man. Because we also have the same terminology, Ish, referred to as by Moshe Rabbeinu. Because the Ksiv of the verse reads, Va'ish Moshe, Anav, Mikal, Anav, Ma'od, the man Moshe was exceedingly um, humble. Again, this term Ish. So Yeshua is referred to as Ish, a man, and Moshe Rabbeinu is referred to as Ish, a man. So why are you saying that when the verse says bread of the strong ones was eaten by man, it refers to Yeshua, maybe it refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, who is also referred to as Isha man. Why choose one over the other? Clear? Question is clear? The Gemara answers, done in Ish mi Ish, we derive the word Ish as a standalone word from the word Ish as a standalone word, the ain't done in, and we do not derive ish, the word ish as a standalone word, mi ish, from the word ish as it's connected to prefix, two prefixes, and the. So with respect to Yeshua, it says, ish asher boy, a man who has the spirit within him. And that is directly akin to the words in the verse, lechem abidim achal ish, bread of the strong ones was eaten by man, ish, single standing word. Whereas by Moshe Rabbeinu, when, it's, when he's described as ish a man, it's viha ish, and a man. So because it has two prefixes, therefore it is less directly correlated to the word used in Tehillim, which is just a singular word without any prefix or suffix. Is that clear? Answer clear? The Gemara is making a, a, a comparison in description. The verse says in Tehillim, the bread of the strong one was eaten by man. Who's the man? Yeshua is the man. Well, how do we know Yeshua is the man? Because the verse describes him as Ish, a man. The Gemara asked, Moshe Rabbeinu also is referred to as man. The Gemara answers, the reason why we don't choose Moshe Rabbeinu is because the way Moshe Rabbeinu is described as a man is not just the word Ish, but the word Ish has two prefixes there. Ve ha Ish. Vav and the making meaning and the. And therefore, when we make a correlation between two verses that have the same word, we want the two words to be most equally similar rather than dissimilar. And the word describing Moshe as man is dissimilar because it has the extra prefixes there. Ve ha Ish. That's the Gemara's answer. And therefore, it picks Yeshua, clear? Therefore, it says Yeshua is the Ish, because by him it's just, it says straight, Ish, man. More it's more direct. The, 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 the similarity of words are exact, Ish and Ish, as opposed to Ish and Veha Ish, which is what it says about Moshe Rabbeinu. 
Okay, so what does this mean about in the spiritual understanding? If we're understanding mana to mean receiving Torah from heaven, and Yeshua gets the mana equivalent to all Jews because he's given all the Torah as someone who's going to be teaching all the Jews in the next generation. Did Moshe Rabbeinu not get all of uh, Torah? He certainly did. So why wouldn't he be this man? According to our spiritual explanation, that's your reference to Torah. Oh, he's on a higher level like the angels. Moshe Rabbeinu, we said before, what was the proof that the angels don't eat uh, food? It wasn't actually a verse about angels. It was a verse about Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu said, when I was on the mountain, I didn't eat any bread and I didn't drink any water. Proof that in heaven there's no food and water. Which means Moshe Rabbeinu was not on the level of someone who ate manna and that was his relationship with Torah. His relationship with Torah was such that he was like the angels. Right? And we suggested that when it comes to food, even though the food comes part of me, which is why it's a metaphor for Torah, Torah becomes part of my knowledge, becomes part of my mind, and the more I absorb Torah, the more, I th the more Torah becomes part of who I am, like food that physically becomes part of who I am. So when it comes to food, that there's, even though it becomes who I am, there's still separation. There's me and the food, and I need to process the food to make it part of me. So likewise with Torah. There's me and there's Torah, and I need to process Torah to make it part of me. But for an angel, there is no food, there is no drink, because there is no separation between him and the Torah. It's not just Torah somewhere out that the angel has to discover. It's part of who he is just from, just from the start. And the same thing is true of Moshe Rabbeinu when he goes up to the mountain. The Torah that he absorbs is such that it's just part of who he is. He doesn't have to go and discover it. Whereas Yeshua has to eat the manna. It's true he gets the manna equivalent to all the Jewish people, and therefore he has all of Torah. But nonetheless, he still has to absorb it like food, like manna that he's eating. Now, how is that alluded to in the verse here when we describe Moshe Rabbeinu as ish, as a man? There's the prefix, viha ish, and the man. Perhaps what that does is, when you say ish, a man, then there's a person here. He's an independent person, has his ideas, and then he's absorbing all of Torah. Okay? But viha ish, and the man, Im implies, the prefix turns it into a secondary. When you add the, when you put the word and, you're saying that what follows and is secondary to what we said earlier. That's what the word and does. It makes it tuffel. It makes it secondary. So viha ish and the man means the fact that Moshe was a man was secondary to who he truly is. He was truly angel, angelic in that sense. But it's only secondary to viha ish and the man. He's also a man. He happens to be a man too because he happens to have a physical body. But primarily, he's not a. Of course, he's a physical person. I don't want to get into bad ideas about what we believe in Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is a physical person like every other human being in the world and had a body like everybody else. But who he was on the soul level was not human in the regular sense. He lived in a world of prophecy, in a world of connectivity to Hashem, in which his ish, his, man, his being a man, was with a vav, was and, was secondary to who he is. Right? In Tanya, we had a similar thing, if you remember way back we learned Tanya where there's a, a level described there of a tzaddik whose animal soul is so uh, transformed to being nothing other than the service of Hashem that when he would eat he would say I have to go feed that body not I have not like I have to eat because I'm hungry I, I am my godly soul connected to Hashem if there's a body there that's hungry okay I got to go take care of it that's like Veha Ish and the man. It's secondary to who he is. As opposed to Yeshua, which was a Ish, a man, and he absorbed all of Torah on this very lofty level. But not the same as Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's perhaps what this Gemara means here in its more spiritual level. Okay, we'll do another teaching from the Gemara here because this is a beautiful teaching from the Gemara. It's pretty... Uh, it's a weighty piece of Gemara, but it's... It's important to know this Gemara. And then uh, we'll, that'll open up for discussion for tomorrow, God willing. So the Gemara says this, as follows. We're one, two, three, four, five lines from the top of the page. Fourth word. The students asked their teacher, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, the famous Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai of Lag Baimer of the Zayhar. So they asked them. Why did the Jews not get the manna once a year? 
instead of having to every morning go out and collect, they should just get the uh, beginning of the year, they get a dump of mana. In the same way, it's miraculous in all kinds of ways. It'll be miraculous that it stays fresh. And that's it. You keep it in your house, keep it in your storage room, and you don't have to every morning go out and get your mana. Why, why uh, every morning? So it's interesting because at the beginning of the discussion of the mana, way uh, back two, two, two and a half pages ago, the Gemara said that the, there was a certain anxiety associated with the mana because they, every morning, like every day, they only had enough bread for that day. Imagine every day you ate the last morsel of bread in your closet. There's this anxiety. How am I going to get bread tomorrow? What am I going to eat tomorrow? But over here, I guess, a similar thing. Maybe the students are asking, why put them through this? Just give them mana for a year straight. Let them have a supply and they'll be okay. Or they have to spend their time anxiously every day morning waiting for mana to arrive. So Omer Lahem, Abishum Bayechai, I'm sorry, responds to them. Em Shalacham Marshal. I will give for you a parable, la Mahadova Dimer, to what the matter can be compared. La Melech Basavadam, to a king of flesh and blood, king, human king, Shiesh Lai Ben Achad, he has one singular prince, one singular son. So Posak Lam Lai Mizanaisav, Pamachas Bashana, he gave the kid an allowance. Mizanaisav literally means food, but it's an allowance, you know, he gave him his Parnosa once a year. So every year, on whatever day it was, on his birthday, here's your check for the year. You know, this is your, this is your um, budget for the year. So what happened? He wouldn't visit his father, because he would only visit his father once a year. Right? When you're in camp, you only call Tati, send me money. Right? Otherwise, you have to call home for it. So the child only visited his father once a year to pick up his check. So the Ahmad, the king, got up and decided, Uposak was an Isav and gave him an allowance Instead of giving it to him once a year, divide it up by the days and gave it to him b'chol yom every day. And then, and then the child would visit his father every single day. So likewise, af Yisrael also to Yidin. Mishi yesh le'arba Someone who had four or five children. He's got a family to feed. He would be worried. He, had, he was anxious. And he would say, Maybe tomorrow I won't get the mana. It's not like he had in the storage more food. He's nervous. What are we going to have tomorrow? The Nimtsu, and he would, the, the father, uh, the Jew who had four or five children in the desert, would say, Kula mason, but, oh, My children are all going to die of starvation. So what did he do? What would his father do? Davin Tashem. So the Nimtsu, the result is, Kula Machab Mitzlim Shabbat All these concerned parents in the desert, concerned for their children's welfare, every day would be Davin Tashem, please provide mana tomorrow for my children. And this way, Hashem kept the Jews engaged with him. It's quite a, quite a heavy statement. It's, uh, you can look at it this way. The reason why Hashem puts, us, puts a Jew through challenge, there's always, a, 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 there's always something to be, grow, to be learned and to grow from a challenge. And that's why Hashem created these challenges. Hashem wants to deepen the relationship with the Yid. And the way, Hashem, the way a Jew deepens his relationship with Hashem is by overcoming challenge. In the case of the manna, it's the, the father being nervous that his children aren't going to have food. So he, this, is, this is how he, how Hashem elicits from him that he should talk to Hashem every day by asking Hashem, please provide manna for my family. Now, if, we, if that's the case, then that means the sooner we look at the challenge and grow from it, the sooner the challenge will disappear. Because the whole point of the challenge was that we should deepen our relationship with Hashem. So the quicker you do it, the quicker the challenge disappears. Following? You should remember that when things are good also. Not just when things are... You know. We shouldn't be like that child who, because he gets a check once a year, only shows up to thank Hashem and ask Hashem for once a year. Even when things are good, stay engaged with the relationship with Hashem and you, God forbid, won't need to rely on a mana scenario where one, we have to, every morning you have to ask Hashem, please provide food for my children. It's quite a heavy uh, little parable here. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So that's like, exactly right. So if we're going to compare this to Torah study, it's a similar thing. As opposed to the child who's born with all the Torah knowledge that he has, before 
He has to go every day and find new Torah, new Torah, new insight, and work hard and hard. And that way, the relationship is, in, is an engaging one. If the child was born with all the Torah knowledge and that was the rest of his life, then he would never check back into Torah again. And his relationship to Hashem would end at that point. But because he doesn't have Torah every, just all at once, he's got to every day fight for new Torah, new Torah, new Torah. That's correct. And then the Gemara answers two other explanations for why the Torah was given every day. Another explanation for why the mana was given every day as opposed to mana slash Torah given every day rather than once a year. So on the literal level, it means like this, literally talking about the food. They would eat the mana when it was still hot and fresh. So when it landed in the morning, it was fresh. So even though I, su- I suggested earlier that perhaps there could have been a miracle that the mana stayed fresh, here the Gemara is implying it wouldn't have been hot if it wasn't given that day. Why couldn't it be a miracle? I don't know. Why couldn't it be a miracle that the mana stays fresh? Who knows? But if we're talking about Torah learning, it would make sense. Because if I don't learn Torah every day, then it's not fresh, it's not hot. If you just learn, you know, like a, like a person who learns in yeshiva, and he got all of his Torah knowledge then, and then the rest of his life he just, you know, he banks on the fact that he, I know Torah because I learned many years ago. And it's not cham, it's not fresh. You have to eat, eat the mana, you have to take your Torah intake every day. So it's fresh Torah study that you're engaged in. Similar thing. And likewise, the Gemara Tovar Acher, a third explanation for why the mana was given every day rather than once a year, because of the burden of traveling. So literally this means if they, they never knew when they were going to travel. Some places they stayed in for a day and some places they stayed in for years. Right? So if they got the mana once for years, so when they packed up their tents and carried, they'd also just pack up all that mana and carry. That would be quite uh, laborious. So, so, so to do it, to do my favor, Hashem says, I'm going to... I'm going to give you the mana every day so you don't have to worry about uh, um, carrying it around. In terms of Torah learning, perhaps that means, you know, don't, some people get overwhelmed by how much there is to know and how much there is to learn, how much, there's so much I have to learn, I have to learn all this and all that. Take every day's burden on a, on a daily basis. What do you have to learn today? You have your daily chumash you have to cover, you have your daily rambam, your daily gabara. So you cover your daily learning, and then tomorrow's a new journey, and tomorrow you'll carry the load of tomorrow's learning. Don't get overwhelmed on thinking, one day you have to cover everything. And I'll conclude with this, I had a Rosh Hashiva, he's told me to tell us in Detroit, that I don't remember who he was quoting. He was quoting someone who would say that I became a scholar in five minutes. That's how I became a scholar. Five minutes became a scholar? He says, yeah, all those five minutes. And oh, there's only five minutes left of the hour to end early. All right, I, whatever, I have 10 minutes until my next appointment. Okay, I'll just wait it out. All those little five minutes and 10 minutes. Instead of wasting time, he actually learned. That's how he became the scholar. So it's not like the whole thing is going to be dumped on you at once. That's not, that's not how Torah is acquired. Torah is acquired on a daily basis, carrying the load of each day. Not that you have to carry it all at once. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful idea and beautiful teaching. And tomorrow we get to more incredible stuff about the mana. And in the... Interesting twist, it's going to be connected to the Noah's flood, something we learned about in the last Gemara. Still not sure how they're connected in terms of their uh, spiritual meaning, but perhaps. All right, have a wonderful day, everybody.